Smart City의 현 현지... The 2021 World Smart City Expo, where we can get a bird's eye view of the future and present status of Smart City. We are at the tech conference, and my name is Cho Woo-jung. In the previous session, we talked about the role of Smart City for carbon neutrality. We had an in-depth discussion, and now we are going to focus on data. Data. There is a saying that smart cities are not built uh, with steel and concrete, but with data. This means that data is so important for smart cities. So how are we going to utilize data, which will be the materials we're building future cities? We will be looking into that topic during the session. First of all, let me introduce the moderator of this session, Professor Yoon Jung. She has a presentation prepared. Please greet her with a big round of applause. Yes, good. Afternoon. My name is Yoon Jung of Yonsei University. Now, Cho Jung, I am a big fan. Yes, thank you. The World Smart City Expo. I have been participating every year, and I understand that this is the last session before the closing ceremony. So it's a very meaningful opportunity for all of us, and I think that we will be focusing on smart city data in an in-depth manner. So I welcome uh, this topic or the discussion on this topic. And I would like to talk about three things related to our agenda. First of all, everyone gathered here today will agree that when we look at smart cities, and think about data, we can think of three core things. First of all, that would be the city data platform. The smart city is based on data, and so the platform is very important. And for that, there are many different elements involved. So number one would be platform. And number two, there has to be a participation by many citizens. And we, for that, we need the spatial data for visualization. And last but not least, this is for the future. But when we talk about the future, we talk about a lot of different horizons. And there is a short-term future. And also, there are the signals. But that will be realized in the near future. And we have to think about data exchange. So the three topics that I would like to touch upon would be data platforms, spatial data, and data exchange for smart cities. OK. So uh, Professor Yu, I think we should, you mentioned platform and spatial information, spatial data, and data exchange. So let us dive into that in a while. But I think we have a video prepared. Yes, actually, I think it's a video on Amazon's data cloud. Solutions Architect based in Australia. At Amazon, we have a phrase we like to use. It's always day one. And when we say it's always day one, we're referring to maintaining the spirit of a startup even as we scale, and be able to respond quickly and effectively to customers' needs. When we think about smart cities in the last couple of years, it's never been more important for smart cities to be able to respond quickly to changed circumstances. At Amazon, we're guided by leadership principles, and one of those is customer obsession. Customer obsession refers to putting the customer at the centre of everything that we do and working backwards from, from them in how we design our services and products. If we think about smart cities, it's important to put the citizen at the centre of everything that we do and work backwards from them in everything that we design around our smart cities. Increasingly, sustainability is taking on a more important role as we look at smart cities. A great example of this is the University of Melbourne. The University of Melbourne, Australia's number one university, chose Amazon Web Services for its smart campus platform in 2018. By incorporating data from IoT networks, occupancy sensors, building management systems, they were able to save $400,000 in energy costs in 2020 and also plan a return to campus safely. When I speak to transport experts around the world, they always refer to three challenges, especially for road transport. That of safety, congestion and sustainability again. 
In Melbourne, Amazon Web Services has been working with the Australian Integrated Multimodal Ecosystem on solutions to some of these challenges. One of the industry partnerships has been with Peak Hour, who built an artificial intelligence platform which incorporated data from road sensors provided by the Transport Department and it used that data anonymously to predict traffic patterns hours in advance. And this platform, once set up, can be effective with only a few hours worth of data. So let's take a step back and look at smart cities from a higher level. Often we have sensors and networks and they're sending data into a data storage and management layer. And then we have consumers of that data who are looking for dashboards and insights so they can make better decisions. And increasingly we're seeing the role of machine learning in this space as well, where we're seeking to predict or forecast the future so we can make better planning decisions. Amazon Web Services has tens of thousands of partners globally, and many of them are building solutions for cities now that incorporate some or all of these components. And many of these partners are now seeking ways to better share data across all these solutions. Let's talk about some of them. In Melbourne, Amazon Web Services and the city built an emerging testbed solution for a smart park at Argyle Park. That incorporated sensor data from a meshed LoRaWAN network that included bin sensors, environmental sensors, we even had sensors on park benches. That data was loaded into a data lake, and then on the other side, we had another partner called Peclip, which built dashboards that allowed the city to see and visualize data in real time and make better decisions. Wellington City Council chose Consegna to help them with an all-in migration. Consegna was chosen because it had unique capabilities and Wellington was seeking to uplift their own capability. What they found is that by migrating to the cloud, it freed up resources to be able to focus on higher order activities. They used Amazon Connect for a call center service, for example, and they also built their digital twin using Amazon Web Services. In Newcastle, they enlisted WSP Digital to build a city intelligence platform that incorporated lots of data for sharing across the city, including data from a LoRaWAN network partner of ours, NNNCO. And what all of these customers found that as they were getting more insights into their platform, it wasn't linear like this. The data and insights that they were getting, it was actually helping them get smarter and allowed them to reinvest in the platform so they could get smarter over time. It was more of a virtuous cycle, if you like. I just wanted to finish by saying that around the world, Amazon Web Services is building cloud innovation centres. And here we are launching one in Busan in Korea. Cloud Innovation Centres seek to bring together students, researchers, universities, AWS and city officials to solve some of the public sector's big challenges, including those in smart cities. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something today about Amazon Web Services and smart cities. There's two QR codes there if you'd like to download an ebook to hear more about the solutions we have in region. And there are a couple of email addresses there if you'd like to get in contact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we saw the presentation of uh, AWS and also the presentation by Professor Yoon Jung. We have just opened up uh, the discussion under the Smart City Data Live session. Professor Yu, I understand that you're a city expert, or a, actually you are more better known as a data expert, but why is it that you've become a city expert as well? Well, let me explain this simply. Well, we see smart city, right? So we're focusing on the smart element. And so how are we going to make cities smart? There are many ways to make cities smart. And I think that one of the basic ingredients for this would be data. Smart, you have to make smart decisions, make smart judgments based on facts. What is facts? What are facts? Data. So data is continuously being generated. For example, we have these gadgets and devices from the automobiles, from the pipelines of our cities. We see a flood of data being generated. And the data that is being generated within our living spaces are being shared at a low cost, and we're using that to make good decisions. And so that helps us operate and run our cities in a smart manner. So if we research and study the data, then we will be able able to find smart ways to apply the data to our cities. So we talk about the data-driven smart cities, right? 
And that's why we I mentioned the three subtopics that I want to talk about when we discuss smart cities. Yes, thank you very much. You seem like you would have been a great tutor. That was a very good way to understand the concept. So in this session, we well, we can call this a software session for cities, right? Yes. Okay, so it's now time to introduce the panel discussant. Hey. Yeah. Uh, yes. First of all, uh, we have uh, Lee Jungmin, or should I uh, introduce you to our panelists? We have Director Lee Jungmin of Hong Kong Life Care. Very nice to meet you. Uh, yes, would you like to greet our audience, please? Um, yes, I am doing my best to, to make the smart city in our imagination a reality. I'm a smart city planner, Lee Jungmin, and Hong Kong Life Care has been uh, doing its utmost to provide safety equipment in various disaster situations in our everyday life. So what we do is utilize the data from such personal safety equipment and we're trying to create a safer society. And what we are particularly focused on is providing products and services where the citizen can actually take advantage of. Yes, I believe that you probably have a reason why you wanted to recommend uh, Director Lee as a panelist. Yes, in the past, uh, I met him at a Digital Twin related session. So Digital Twin uh, is uh, the exact twin of what's happening in the physical world. So when we do the simulation, we can immediately apply that to reality. And this is utilized quite extensively in urban planning. And uh, we've actually used this in Cheonju as well as in other uh, parts of the nation. So because we're talking about data, and it's about data smart cities. So that's why I recommend it directly. Yes, thank you very much. And moving on. And next, uh, representing a company uh, that has developed a new land development model based on AI based architectural design technology and big data. Director Im Hae of Spacewalk, head of business. Yes, good afternoon. I am In Hae Yeon, head of business at Spacewalk. Spacewalk actually utilizes the big data from cities and AI technology to do simulations for land development. Usually, people say that when you try to build a house, you age uh, 10 years uh, during the process because it's such a stressful experience. But we provide the technology and the service to make your ex experience uh, better. Yes. So, Professor Yu, I understand that you're interested in AI based technology. That's why you recommended uh, Director Yip? Yes. Well, she just explained it very well, but let me make this a little bit easier to understand. Spacewalk is the name of the company, and this company is known as Property Technology, Prop Tech Company. This is a leading startup in the field of Prop Tech. We do real estate development and city development. And there's a lot involved, but I understand that what Spacewalk usually does is focus on the small scale development projects. So you want to develop land, but you're not sure what the value of that land would be and how much profit you can make by developing that land. So let's say that if I want if I build a building there, would I be able to experience any difficulty? Would I be able to make profit? What this company does is help you make a decision based on big data analysis. So you can know the profit that you can obtain by developing that land. And it provides very detailed information. And that kind of service is provided to the citizens by smart, uh, Spacewalk. Yes, so you make something that's very obscure into a very transparent and vivid concrete information, right? Yes, that is correct. OK, so we heard from Amazon about how Amazon is being involved in building cities. That's very interesting because usually when we think about Amazon, we think it's an IT distribution company. But as you can see, that is really deeply involved in the development of cities. That was remarkable, actually. So what do you think, Professor? Well, I think I'm hogging the mic. It's OK. It's OK. Well, Amazon, as you know, well, it has 
uh, online shopping mall. And uh, Amazon is working with 11th Street of Korea to provide a better experience to the Korean shoppers. But Amazon, actually, if you look at the operating profit, about 4.5% or 5% operating profit is generated, but about 55% is driven by online sales of products. But over 30% of its revenue comes from Amazon Web Service. So this is about cloud. The PC data is actually uh, in the cloud and is managed by the Amazon Cloud Service provided by AWS. And the Amazon Web Service actually brings a lot of revenue for Amazon. It's the number one company when it comes to that kind of service. And of course, compared to, well, if you think of the operating profit, it can go up from 30% to 50%. So why is this service important for smart cities? Well, It's not just the data that you have at your local uh, PC, but actually you have the utilities. Um, the data is coming from the utilities and many other systems in the cities. And you have to combine all of this data to obtain insight. You cannot just have the data in silo and try to analyze and understand what's happening in your cities. So the you need to have an integrated analysis of all the data coming from the cities. And so for that, you need expertise. And so in order to deal with the data pipeline, uh, there are many people involved. And so you need a high level of expertise, cost, and also sustainability. So you need the expertise, the expert services provided. In the society that we live in, we will see data increasing, AI will further develop, and as AI technology advances, the cloud will also grow and advance as well. So in order to provide city data services, the cloud is actually the foundation, and the leading company for that is Amazon, AWS. Can you say uh, are you a fast talker? Well, I've heard that we have to swiftly end the session because we do have a closing ceremony. That's why I thought I have to hurry. No, it's okay. You can pace yourself. It's okay to speak slowly. No worries. Uh, so then let us now uh, pose a question to Director Lee Jung-min. Oh, well... You can see that, well, we are citizens, but for the private sector, how do you perceive data? Uh, when we think about the smart city, it's about collecting data uh, on the city. And this uh, data will be gathered in significant amounts and significant volumes. For example, every time we move around, every action point will be a node of data. And what we have to do is utilize this data. And if we want to do that, we have to gather this information in a vessel, for instance. Let's say that we were playing a game, and then all of a sudden it stopped. The screen froze. Then what will happen to all of your game items? It would be so frustrating if it does happen. Yes, it really will make me furious, of course, yes. So in the same vein, when we do run a city, if all of a sudden there are buffering issues, then of course it will be a major catastrophe. There will be accidents, we may be seeing uh, people fainting, all sorts of things may happen. And in addition to that, I can see that it's going to be extremely frustrating. It's not just for me, I think it will be the same case for everyone. For instance, let's say there was a power cut. It will be a major panic, chaotic situation for everyone. Isn't that the case? Yes, of course. So all of the resources need to be utilized in an efficient fashion, and for that to be possible, we need the cloud technology. And if we look at cloud computing, it's about gathering all resources, data together, and efficiently reallocating such resources. And because of uh, these traits, uh, it's important to gather inf the information, reprocess the information, and make this or turn this into an in to information. And that, the data platform will be necessary. And the companies will be using the data platform and will be utilizing the data, and will be using that data. Uh, to convert that into services for the citizens. So that's how we perceive data. So, so then it's basically like a, maybe the control tower in the apartment complex. 
Well, it seems a bit difficult to understand, so it would be great if you can put it into layperson's um, terms. So that's why I wanted to use that analogy. So for the citizens and the private sector, we now know, understand your approach. But I think that uh, the two may be aligned. It's not different. So between public interest and public, private interest, isn't there uh, some sort of interface between the two? Do you agree? Yes, I do agree. And so it was well explained by Director E. Lee. But actually, there are services provided based on the cloud uh, that can benefit the people. And actually, I prepared a presentation to help you enhance your understanding about this. OK, so let us see that presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, uh, you have to keep up, huh? Yes. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, smart city, smart city development. What do you think this means? This is a photo of Seoul. You can see that there's a lot of buildings and houses. And if you look at the data, you can see that there is 38.26 million lots of land in Korea. And according to Seoul City data, 41% of the buildings in total are uh, were built 25 years or even before that. So as you can see, these old buildings can be transformed like this. But you have to abide many laws. There are actually at present around 23 laws that you have to abide by. And actually, the laws change every seven to eight times per year on average. And this becomes an obstacle for development projects. So what we do is we utilize the public information and the big data, and we utilize the an engine to do an analysis to provide information about real estate development to the citizens so that they can have a better understanding of what kind of development projects that they should pursue. And they can have a better understanding of how efficiently they can develop land. So let me explain in detail the service that we have. Our leading service is Land Book. And what we do is you can click on a certain plot of land, and it shows the similar lands surrounding it and the trading prices for those land lots. And also, you can identify what purposes the lands are being used for, what the sites are being used for. And also, if you want to actually rebuild a building, uh, redevelop it, then you can actually see where the parking lot should be located or how many parking slots you can make. You can get the floor plan and etc. And so you can use it yourself, but also you might want to rent out the buildings that you build. And so you can look into the rent-related aspects as well. And these types of information information are provided to the citizens based on our service. Yes, well, I think that that helps us better understand what the service is about. But is this really a service for smart cities? Or is it just an extension of the existing real estate services that we had in the past? The AI technology professor. How much potential does it have, and how should we perceive this technology? Well, let me tell you my two cents. I think that, let's say, I'm not sure if you have any land that you own. No, I don't have any land. Why are you saying this? Well, let's say that you do own land. You own real estate, and you want to develop that land. And let's say that you need information to develop it, there will be a limitation because it's difficult to gain and obtain all of the information that you need to develop that land. But actually, this service provides all of the information you need to develop that land in an integrated manner. For that, you need a lot of different public information. But the service gathers that uh, public information. It applies different algorithms and gathers all the laws, regulations, and public information to provide you with that insight. So it's a new technology. It's a new service. And. I think that people who are hesitant to develop real estate uh, can actually engage in such projects, development projects, more efficiently now. And that enhances transparency and effectiveness and efficiency of these real estate development projects. So it makes development more efficient because you have the information, the data to help you make decisions. So if this is possible, then this is remarkable. It's really innovative because right now you have to go. You have to 
walk. You have to go to the uh, real estate experts. And it takes all day to visit these people, get information, right, and to look into the registers, right? But now you can have the information provided to you at your very footsteps, right? Right to you. Yes, that is correct. So you can make a comprehensive decision based on all of the different information that is provided. So it provides you with an integrated analysis. And so it shows you how you can utilize data to obtain smartness. So then we have data, uh, and this becomes information. So what kind of challenges can it uh, solve us? Uh, solve for us. Can you maybe give us some more information on that? Any examples that you would like to share? So maybe, see many on directing you, you can add. Yes, actually, I had more slides, but I was cut off. But if I may add on, um, well, there is land book safety. It's another type of service that we provide. And I understand that it was June of 2018 in Yongsan. There was a dilapidated building that collapsed. Uh, the house itself, the building itself was really dilapidated, but actually surrounding that building, there was a lot of construction projects ongoing. And so that affected that building, and that was what led to the collapse of the building. So we want to actually map all of the old assets and also combine that information with the real estate information surrounding it and see what kind of impact these dilapidated real estate assets um, can receive from the surrounding development projects. There has to be safety analysis uh, done, but actually the service helps you identify the safety level of the buildings and also make help you make decisions. So this is uh, good for the public. Yes, actually it's in line with the interests of the people living in such neighborhoods. Yes, but I think that the speculators, those who want to invest in real estate, you might think that those are the only people who can benefit from this service. No, that is not true. Because if you look into the cities, you can see that many different elements are organically connected together. And when you have to redevelop a neighborhood, you can see that there are many conditions that have to be improved and many people are affected by that. So it's not just about making real estate investments or speculative investments, but it's about how you can actually distribute the budget to benefit the people. Yes, so let's say that there is a space, there is land around the world, and let's say that you can divide the land in the world into uh, 57 trillion cells. And let's say that everyone can obtain information about these 57 trillion cells, and there will be greater transparency in the world, and also this will really improve the expenses and costs associated with that. And I think that Spacewalk is contributing to bring that kind of transparency. Yes, okay, so you're saying that it's really about getting rid of the fog and making everything transparent. It's important to convert this into data. So then, um, Director Lee, would you like to chime in on, on this conversation? I, I think uh, I'm here uh, at the center, sitting at the center, and um, I don't know how I should contribute. But as I was living for more than well, 40 years, uh, I feel this very heavy sense of responsibility. Uh, because for the 40 years, I lived off of my handsome face. But then again, I have to cover my face with a face mask. So well, would you like to uh, expose yourself? No, due to COVID, I can't do that. That's quite unfortunate. At any rate, uh, if I may uh, add a couple of comments. In order for the citizens to take advantage of such data, there are specific steps uh, that you have to go through. It's the smart city service, so when it's planned, I think that we need a total of four phases. First is uh, when collecting data, so it's about uh, converting it into data. You can see that in the matrix film, there are all of these bits of zero and one. So when these data, when such data is added together for the citizens, it really doesn't ring a bell for them. So what we have to do, we have to collect this data and we have to make this usable. We have to process this, we have to refine the data, and we call this informatization. So converting the data into information. And then with uh, this uh, 
information from data. You also talked about convergence and combinations or integration. So what we have to do is converge this data with other data uh, to create this into services that we can actually experience. And then we create these experiences and these uh, and these services, that, which will generate new data. And this chain, the data will get more refined and turn will be converted into intelligence. Let me give you an example. I know that there's also a presentation by Tom Tom, but let me talk about the GPS system or the navigation system. In the case of the navigation system, there's a lot of data that will be going in. We have map data, we have the height of the buildings, there are all sorts of data that will be going into the navigation system. And the diverse uh, information or data will be all uh, will be all in keyed in into the navigation system, which we call converting into data. But we have maps, buildings, roads, and we have camera information and data. So all of this data will be gathered or meshed together, which will be converted into information. And through this information, what we can do. Uh, is to be offered with navigation services or road information services, or maybe uh, guide us to a gourmet restaurant. Citizens can understand and take advantage of this information. These days, uh, there's a lot of talk on autonomous driving, and the data converted into information can be used uh, in these various services, which will, of course, make it more refined to turn this into intelligence. We have the navigation features. We also have uh, the various search functions to find or go to a specific location. But in addition to that, are there any other use cases that you would like to share with us? Recently, if we look at the apartment complexes, there are clean rooms uh, where we have automatic waste disposal systems. But if you go to old cities, there are still the garbage collecting trucks that would be um, passing across the cities. If we look at their circulation routes, it's important to make sure that it's optimal. There is a specific volume of garbage or data that would be disposed, so that should be calculated. And you need to consider the existing circulation route and the speed of the trucks. And also, you need information on the traffic situation. And if we use all this information, we can create new routes to have the garbage collected uh, quickly than in the past. And the citizens do not have to suffer from the odor from the garbage. So this could be one additional layer of service or an evolution of services that can be offered to our citizens. Uh, Director Lim? Yes, well, at our company, we are testing uh, something known as automated agriculture uh, services. And actually, you probably know this, but about 60% of our land, aside from the mountainous areas, are used for agricultural production. And so if we can upgrade the productivity of agriculture, that would be great. So we thought that perhaps we can utilize the data. For example, the CO2 level, everything, all of these can be made into data to help enhance the productivity level of agriculture. And if this becomes commercialized, then I think that this can really contribute to a better life or quality of life in smart cities. What about you, Professor uh, Yu? Well, I think that I keep on repeating this, but there are many different examples, many different symptoms, but the logic underlying everything is the same. The services are provided to the citizens, and this leads to an enhancement of the quality of life. And at the bottom of that would be data. So data helps improve the quality of life of people. And also, I understand that there is presentations by TomTom, Tom, for example, and these are very interesting cases. So why don't we take a look at the video? So you have a hot temper, no? You speak very fast. I think that you like to hurry up things. But I think we, we have uh, some parts to cover before we go to the video. So don't worry about it. We will be watching the video. But anyhow, you did mention TomTom. Tom, so why don't we take a look? Uh, Tom Tom is a Netherlands company, and I th it, it's a navigation company. So why don't we take a look at the video and then continue? According to the World Health Organization, 
Air pollution can be attributed to 4.2 million premature deaths annually around the world. The United Nations, through its Sustainable Development Goals, aims to provide directions on how to make our cities and urban settlements safe, inclusive, resilient and more sustainable. Hi, I'm Christoph Woodry from TomTom and today I'd like to speak to you about how TomTom's products and services are contributing to improving the living standards in our cities across the world. At TomTom, our vision of a safe, connected world, free of congestion and emissions, closely aligns to SUG 11. TomTom is a leading location technology company founded on decades of innovation in the turn-by-turn -turn navigation space, with a depth of knowledge on how to get people efficiently from A to B. We're on a mission to create the most innovative technologies to help shape tomorrow's mobility, supporting customers with data products, services, and software in order to help solve simple and complex problems. For example, like routing the most effective way through a congested city or helping urban planners to make the most out of their infrastructure funding. At the core of our products are our maps and traffic content. An SD map with accurate road address and POI information, along with a HD map that can support the latest in autonomous driving functionalities. This rich content is available in a range of APIs and SDKs, enabling map rendering, destination search, and route optimization. TomTom Tom Traffic is an accurate and real-time information service, giving drivers precise information, enabling better routing and ETA. These services are used across a wide range of mobility platforms, including car and smartphone manufacturers, mobility app makers, and across government organizations. TomTom's real-time maps and traffic services rely on large volumes of big data sourced from millions of connected devices, with trillions of data points collected over the years since we began to use anonymized GPS measurements to maintain our products. To give you an idea of the amount of data available to TomTom, here is a snapshot of one month's worth of GPS probe data represented as a heat map from 2017 on the left and 2019 on the right. Now, circling back to the title of my presentation, which was Location Technologies for a Safe Connected World Free of Congestion and Emissions, I wanted to highlight a few use cases. The first is around road safety, where for the last couple of years, we've been working with organisations across the world to try and identify locations on the road network where we feel that road authorities should be prioritising their funding for road safety upgrades. We do this by combining our curvature data with our speed data, with our actual real world observations from our mobile mapping vans in order to determine indeed if some infrastructure upgrades should be carried out in those locations to make the roads safer for all road users. Now the second use case I wanted to highlight is a little bit closer to home for me. What you can see in this slide is a representation of the congestion across the city of Melbourne over the past seven days. If you look at the red line and you compare it to the grey and dotted lines, these represent the traffic congestion across those same periods of time in 2019 and 2020. And what we can see at the moment in Melbourne specifically due to the ongoing lockdowns related to COVID is a significant reduction in the amount of traffic on the roads. Not only has congestion reduced 14% on average, if we have a closer look, we can actually see that the morning peak hour is not only reduced, but also is now occurring later in the day. Looking at other cities like Hong Kong, we see a completely different trend with a rather large increase in congestion. And this could be partly due to a number of factors, possibly economic recovery, patronage of public transport reducing, and so on. What's clear though, is that the pattern or the distribution of the traffic across the day has drastically changed, where the morning peak now continues throughout the day and increases even further in the evening. The TomTom Tom Traffic Index is available freely in over 400 cities around the world and contains a wealth of information showing just how traffic has changed over the past few years. The TomTom Tom Move portal is a gateway to a suite of advanced analytic products for city authorities. From historical traffic stats, live traffic monitoring, route analysis, origin destination analysis, and the recently released junction analytics, all of these tools can be used by city planners to help ease congestion across our cities. Through the portal, we give cities around the world the ability to contribute to the traffic service, which has been consumed by millions of their citizens, either via their smartphones or in their vehicles. This can be done through the Road Event Reporter, where authorities are able to feed directly upcoming road closures and traffic incidents into the traffic service. As you can see, 
TomTom has a range of location technology products and services that can really make a difference in leading to a world free of congestion and emissions. Thank you. 네, 어, 저는 이... Thank you. I thought that the Tom, uh, TomTom was uh, just a navigation or GPS company, but I can see that you use existing corporate infrastructure uh, to solve uh, traffic issues, which is a very important challenge. So I can see that it actually improves urban environment as well as uh, resolve congestion problems. So, Professor, it contributes not only to traffic, but I believe that this is scalable to other areas. Yes, that's correct. As mentioned by the director of TomTom, Tom, it's about utilizing data to improve the city environment. It's not about uh, enhancing air quality, but rather it's about traffic. It's about efficiency. It's about predicting, uh, utilizing data to reduce uh, unnecessary movements or losses uh, to improve the traffic situation of the, of the city. Uh, utilizing navigation technology. And what is this navigation technology? Well, in the case of TMAP that we use, um, it's not uh, something that's combined there. This is uh, a company that was established in 1991 from the Netherlands. So it started off with a GPS navigation service. And now it's uh, an HD map that they're now providing, a high definition map. And Google also offers maps, but just in the same vein. The reason why we need such HD maps is because of autonomous driving. In 2030, we'll have EVs, and we'll have autonomous driving. Uh, in 2045, uh, we may be seeing a smarter AI than human beings. Uh, will that really happen? Well, some future um, futuristic scholars do say that, futurists say that, but uh, AI or robots, of course, we know the case of Tesla, but we're going to be seeing more of these vehicles. So if they do want to drive across uh, the streets, uh, you need radar as well as LIDAR to understand the location, to understand where I am, to understand the road situation, and whether I can go take that route. Uh, is there a guardrail to the left or the right? So you need to make that judgment. And you can actually use LIDAR and camera to see the situation. Uh, but this autonomous vehicle needs a very well-knitted, closely knitted map. Uh, to reduce the cases of accidents. So this is uh, the HD map. And uh, TomTom Tom has transformed itself uh, to become an HD map company. So when we do have autonomous driving, uh, city uh, traffic situations will be more optimized and we will be seeing less human errors and, errors and less accidents accordingly. Therefore, it's going to offer uh, all sorts of technologies, and that's why we can call TomTom Tom not just a navigation, navigation company, but it's about offering the map that would enable autonomous driving in the urban environment. So TomTom Tom has transformed itself into an HD map company. Yes, I see. So as you've mentioned, in running uh, the automobiles, there is a lot of information that we can uh, utilize, and it also controls uh, the speed. And we will need more of such technology in the future. Uh, in the case of Hankam Light Care, you're not in the area of transportation, but I know that you were originally a um, safety equipment company. Is that the case? Yes. Hankam Life Care. If I may give you an introduction, and if I may just simply put, uh, you see firefighters with all sorts of protective gears. They have oxygen um, tanks, and there's also a mask, which we call air respirators, and they use that to put off the fires. So what we do is uh, produce these air respirators and oxygen tasks, um, tanks and masks. But data is quite interesting because it uh, actually brings down borders amongst industries. You collect the data, and depending on how you use this data, you can see that the borders amongst industries will crumble down in your business. For us, what we do is we utilize the data from the air respirators. When the firefighters extinguish the fire on the site, it's important to understand the temperature of the site, and also you need information uh, on how much oxygen, oxygen remains. And let's say that if there are falls, you need information on the falls. And uh, the, our products uh, gather this information, and we have that adopted or reflected in the digital twin. So if, let's say, that the fire expands out, if it uh, breaks up in the first floor, if it goes up to the fourth floor, we need to do a simulation on how this fire uh, will spread. So we also use the data to do that simulation. But I think you talked about uh, the digital twin. Would you like to give some more information on the digital twin? Yes, as mentioned. 
what we're trying to do right now with a digital twin uh, is uh, do a simulation. And you, as you know, we cannot change reality all of a sudden overnight. But if we do want to change, we need to understand the past, we need the history, and we need data that's accumulated. And with accumulated data, we can predict. Uh, we can understand the current status, make predictions, and come up with an optimal con conclusion. We now have that data, and that's why this can be possible. And what is a digital twin? Well, it's uh, a exact copy of reality. Just like the wind turbine, what happens? We also have the wind turbine digital twin on the computer. And if it's 50 years and six months, we will now understand, for instance, GE will understand from their computer that if it's about 51 years, uh, part A will go down because they have data on that. So they do preventative maintenance. They know the timely point of when they have to maintain or replace a part of a wind turbine. Uh, it's the same case for our director Lee Jung Min's uh, company. They produce uh, firefighting air respirators and protective equipment, but it, what they do is use data from these products. And rather than just having this in 2D, if we have 3D, it helps us better understanding. So the digital twin is 3D, we have dashboards, we provide information to the customers, and we can use this for um, urban planning as well as managing the city. Director M, do you have anything else to add? Yes, uh, Professor Yu really explained this very well. There is a company that utilizes digital twin technology. That company is known as Cupix. And what this company does is that it utilizes digital twin technology uh, and apply it to construction sites. So you don't have to go directly. There's a lot of cameras that you can utilize and the data is visualized data. So even though you're not there at the site, you are able to identify the current status of development and construction there. And this really makes the whole process very efficient. And I understand that there are many users here in Korea and overseas as well. So what you can do is that after you finish the construction, you can actually look into the building and you understand how many beams went into it and etc. So it's very useful. Okay, so now at this, well, because you cannot track the entire process after the construction and the development is over, you might have some complaints. For example, the wallpaper. So I I was making I was making a joke, but nobody seems to find this funny. But anyhow, so in the past we were not able to really follow up on what's happening at the construction sites, but now you're saying that we can do that in real time and also we can ensure the safety better than in the past. So digital twin technology is a utilized by many businesses already, right? In the case of Chenju. Uh, uh, we have a cooperative project uh, with the Institute of Land Transport, and uh, it's about enhancing the efficiency of public administration by using the digital twin. And to give you an example, uh, there is one project uh, that we conducted in the past. In the case of last year, we had heavy rainfall. Uh, we saw dikes uh, collapsing because of the heavy rainfall. And we thought, what can we do to predict such a situation in the future? Oh, so what was uh, what happened was uh, we did a 3D model modeling of the Chonju stream or the Chonju River. So there was a sensor that was installed to understand the the level of the stream, for instance. And not only that, meteorological information on precipitation, for instance, uh, was also keyed into the system to. I identify when we will be seeing flooding of the Chenju stream. So such simulation was also conducted. So this is just one example, but there are a lot of services that can be offered by utilizing the digital twin. I can see that it's quite interesting. Uh, data in itself is quite interesting, can do so many things. And depending on how you analyze and how you um, package the data, there could be all sorts of options and all sorts of services possible. So the following company is a quite unique company when it comes to their use of data. Uh, for this conference, we have from all the way from UK, uh, our next speaker, uh, just give us a moment uh, to yes, invite our speaker. From what three words, we have Christine Kim. Please join us on the stage. Very nice to meet you.
Uh, yes, thank you. So you're all the way from the UK. Your presentation, please. Hello, everyone. I am from What Three Words of the UK. My name is Christine Kim. Hey, um, I have seen so many innovations that show us the cities of tomorrow, and it's so exciting. Our company, What Three Words, we are obsessed with location, specifically how to make it simple for everyone to talk about everywhere, especially in cities. Cities will have amazing places like this where you can meet up and go for a walk. It's one street address, maybe a handful of street addresses, but a huge area. You have public places like this in front of Shichon, where a lot of people can gather to celebrate the nation's most memorable achievements. Again, one street address, huge area, a lot of people. Bridges constantly being built in our cities. One address, huge area. And there's a reason why I chose this specific photo that I'll get into later. You have other methods of mobility that are just carpeting our cities. These don't even have street addresses. And of course, we're always building for tomorrow, but until the buildings are built, no addresses. So what is this all leading to? One of the problems that cities face is that the existing addressing systems that we have aren't smart enough for the digital age we live in today. Pins drop right in the middle of the building. They don't help you find exact entrances. GPS coordinates are precise, but they're confusing. I have never heard anyone say this to me. Usually we say, meet me in front of the Starbucks across from my hotel. Humans like words. We speak with words. And so what three words? The question we wanted to answer is, how do you make it simple for everyone to talk about everywhere, no matter where you are in the world? Our team divided the entire world into three by three meter squares and labeled every single square with a three-word address. So for example, I am speaking to you at Ilsang, Changwan, Bunny. But if I were to move a little bit over here, sorry, the GPS isn't working too well because we're indoors. How about if I move a little backward, enter your space a little? Yeah. yeah. I'm speaking to you at Panchok, Songyang, Tangshi. These are addresses, three word addresses, and they do not change. So now we've taken the precision of GPS coordinates and made it into something that humans can interact with so easily. So now, if I'm meeting my friend at Cheonggyecheon, I can tell her to meet me at Eopon, Soryang, Sonte. If you're a public official, and you're in charge of public safety at huge events, you can call an ambulance straight to Puksunga Wanchi Chigon. We are working with emergency response teams in the US and the UK, saving lives every day because they're using precise three-word addresses to get exactly to where a caller is when they're in danger, especially on the highway or on bridges, so that they can save lives faster. And of course, we have partners who are providing smart mobility transportation uh, methods. They're telling customers exactly where to go to find service points. Our partners in construction and public utilities are keeping their engineers and their workers safe by making sure that if they're in danger, they can give a three-word address. Or if they need to fix something along a long pipeline, they can go exactly to where something's cracked and fix it. We're a global standard, we're available in over 50 languages, and we're used by thousands of businesses and organizations worldwide, actually including TomTom, Tom, who you just heard from before mine. In Korea, one of our biggest partners is actually Kakao Map, and you can use what three words inside Kakao Map if you're a user. You just press for one second anywhere on the screen, you'll see W3W pop up, and then you'll see the three word address that you can navigate to or share with your friends. In Mercedes-Benz, you can speak a three-word address and it'll take you exactly where you need to go. Hosts on TripAdvisor, 
Joseph Topoki and so many other businesses around the world are giving three word addresses to people to help them find their locations more comfortably and faster. Three word addresses are incredibly flexible. You can put them into any location system that you already have because we have simple APIs and SDKs that can integrate just right in. And as we grow and our partners are using us for a variety of um, use cases, our hope and our goal is that as cities get smarter, the way in which we talk about location gets smarter as well. Thank you. Tell me that. 네, 감사합니다. 우리 김. Yes, thank you very much, Christine Kim. It's a great pleasure to meet you, and you may now um, take your seats. And once she's in her seat, so we would like to ask her a couple of questions. So that was a presentation on what three words. We were able to understand some interesting um, um, things about the company. So would you like to briefly uh, greet our audience? You can take your time. And Professor Yu, with regard to this presentation, uh, this was quite inspiring. So with regard to these locations, based services, you can actually recognize these very small parcels of land, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, well, this company, uh, this is a well-known company, and I understand that it has received investment of over 150 billion won, and it's working with Kakao and many other Korean companies as well, as it was introduced in the presentation. I think that what is at the core of marketing these days is the location information. So where you are and what kind of person is do, spending how much at what location, I think that is the most important marketing point these days. So because everyone has a mobile gadget in their hands, uh, they provide location data. And as it was mentioned before, ha you have to be able to show uh, the location in a way that the computer can understand. For example, in the past, well, if we use the navigation, it was difficult to pinpoint a location that's about 800 meters or closer to you. Uh, but actually, now you can have more accurate location information provided to you. And this company actually does that. And this was something that was impossible using the previous address system. But now it is applying a new system. And as it was mentioned before, the 3x3 three three, uh, grid, well, it's a very small space. but. Within that space, you can actually provide the accurate location information. It's like, as I mentioned, uh, dividing the land of the world into 57 trillion lots or cells. Now, let's say that we drove here using gate two, and when we use a Kakao taxi service, we can ha hail a taxi exactly to that location, gate two. But this company provides three words for you to show to the taxi driver where exactly you are. And so these three words are used to provide the accurate location information. And this can be used for delivery or calling a taxi or many other uses. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Ms. Christine Kim? Hello, everyone. I am Christine Kim from What Three Words. I'm not that proficient in Korean, uh, so let me speak in English. Yes, uh, the inter uh, the presentation was very interesting. So in Korea, I would like to understand, can you really use this service in Korea? Uh, absolutely. So where What Three Words is actually helpful is when humans come into the equation. One of the things that I found incredible about this country, my country, um, that I love to boast about when I leave is that our technological advancements are so advanced that sometimes you don't need humans to communicate at all. Sometimes it's all from machine to machine to machine. In that case, I'll be very honest, What Three Words is not useful because machines like numbers. Um, I think someone here mentioned before, they like zeros and ones, right? But humans don't like numbers. So if at any point in the uh, workflow, a human wants to give a location, we would rather use words. Mm. Yes, I see. So then, Professor, any questions? Well, well, she mentioned about the technological related aspects as well, but the machines, it expresses everything in numbers, zero or one, but actually human beings, we really don't understand numbers. If it's expressed in zero and one, it's difficult for the people to understand. So everything is uh, provided in words. But when it comes to the technological solution, what is, are there any other technological solutions that can be provided by your company? 
Uh, so our solution is actually very simple. I think it's the ways in which you can use the solution in a variety of different verticals. So for example, we have partners in logistics and delivery because if you think about it, you're constantly moving your fleets across different networks and to get to different fulfillment centers. These fulfillment centers are huge. So then how you make sure that your truck driver goes to the proper loading area instead of entering a gate and then not knowing where to go or walking 14 minutes instead of four because he could have parked closer. So we actually ran a pilot test with Mercedes and DPD, which is a global logistics company. What three words as instructions versus uh, just pins or I think street addresses as instructions. We were able to uh, increase efficiency by at least 15% because the driver using what three words was able to go exactly where he needed to go. We have use cases in food delivery. Outside, you want to sit along the hangang and then you want to enjoy a good time with your friends. The delivery driver can go straight to you instead of asking you to pick it up at a destination that you have to leave your friends for. There's many more examples, but I know we're probably short on time, so I'll, I'll stick with those. Yeah, so. Yes, uh, thank you. So maybe Director Yim Hyeyeon, are there any questions on what three words? Well, I thought that this was a very useful uh, service. And when I was coming to Kintex today, actually I asked two people uh, the way to get here. I asked about how to get to the first exhibition building and also the parking lot. So I had to ask for location information and also the route to get here. But actually, if I use the service, I think that I would have a better experience coming to this building. But I'm curious how you can extract the three words because I looked at your service, I watched the presentation and listened to you speak, but how, how, well, I'm personally, I'm interested. If the three words were made of object, subject, or predicate, it might be easier to remember the words used, but what's the logic that you apply? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the thing about what three words is we're not trying to replace existing addressing systems per se. We add on to them when they fail. And so the reason why the words are a little random is because it's purposely built that way so that, you know, if someone said, doesn't it make more logical sense to have the same subject for two squares that are next to each other and then at least keep that re the relational aspect to it to make it more intuitive? Actually, we don't think that's going to help much because then people can get more confused. If I tell you to meet me at table chair lamp and the square 50 meters that way is table chair lamps, you might misunderstand me and go wait for me over there when I really want you here. So we made similar sounding ones very far apart for that purpose. And so it feels random but it's done that way in order to make sure there's minimal confusion when you're trying to get to a precise location. So the words feel random, but it's actually on, on purpose. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your answer. So it seems like what three words have many different services and you use the location information. Well, uh, Mr. Lee Jung-min, do we have similar services in Korea? Uh, so typically we call this the three-dimensional uh, grid address. Uh, we do have one street address, as mentioned. So if we see, think of Kintex, there is one street address. And these addresses in most, uh, typically will pin the center of the building, as mentioned. So let's say that if we want to meet in front of parking lot one and we order some food, what would happen is we would say, okay, we are here in front of parking lot one of Kintex. And then, I mean, they would, the delivery service will come and then they will call us up again, asking us, where are you? Which door are, or which gate can you see in front of you? And so forth. So in the same way, that's what would happen. However, uh, with what three words and such features, if we use this, it would make our location more precise, uh, more detailed, uh, so that we can get the food delivered right away at that precise location. And there, we, so it can be also used to actually designate the addresses for objects, I believe. For instance, at Sejong City, there is a project which, is, which uses drones uh, to deliver to parks, to public parks. And I believe that for these services, if we can utilize what three words and such features, it can come, um, it can be very helpful in the project. Yes, and Director Lim, anything that you would like to add? Yeah. 
Yes, already many cases have been uh, introduced, but I understand that recently Neighbor has applied the AI-based location information to its engine for Neighbor reservations. So along with the in field of interest uh, of the user, the location information of the user is uh, combined together to recommend some places or the venues for that user to uh, visit. Yes, so what three words gave a very interesting presentation, and why don't we continue our talk with Ms. Christine Kim joining us. And if you have any comments related to the topic that we're discussing, please dive in at any time. So Professor Yu and Zhang, we have been talking about these new services, but what do we need to continue to provide these innovative services? Well, first of all, I think that everything is based on data. So we need the continuous inflow of data, continuous data at the right time. And we can have real-time data, but we need the data to come at the right timing. So we need the continuous flow of data. Uh, and also, let's say that we're doing analysis of the commercial districts. We can have the hard data that we can utilize, or card data, and then the locate credit card data, and then the location data. We can utilize these. So we have to combine different types of data together. So we will be using many different sources of data. And also, we need the platform for the data. So we have the data hub and the data trading centers, or the data tr trading exchanges. And I understand that the Shanghai data exchange uh, will be introduced through a presentation, yes. So can you introduce uh, the Shanghai Data Exchange? Yes, I visited there, and I personally know Vice President Yong Lu of the Shanghai Data Exchange. The Shanghai Data Exchange, well, of course, it's located in Shanghai and also is working with many universities to provide the data. And also, it utilizes a lot of city data that it has collected to deal with transport issues, for example, and tackle environmental issues, for example. So why don't we take a look at the presentation prepared. We were not able to invite uh, Mr. Yong Lu here, but he has sent a presentation. Let's take a look. Hello, everyone. This is Yang Lu from Shanghai Data Exchange. It's really my great honor to be invited by Professor Yu again to join back this World Smart City Expo 2021 in King Tech's Gaoyang. Uh, my today's presentation will be about how data driven to empower the smart city initiatives. So before my formal presentation, I would like to share a good news from Shanghai. So last November, Shanghai has been elected at the top city uh, among 350 some cities from 48 countries in Smart City Expo World Congress 2020. It's a re really good news for Shanghai. And uh, so this year, uh, Shanghai has launched a new initiative called City Digital Transformation. So in this kind of initiative, uh, it consists of three areas. We're trying to implement the digital transformation in governance, in economy, and in livelihood. So let me share with you some few examples in those three areas. So you can understand how Shanghai is leveraged on the data to empower this digital transformation. So in the governance area, as you may know, Shanghai has so many years experiences to implement this, what we call one, one network unified management, which leverage on the consolidated data to implement the city management uh, through uh, different kinds of government agencies and to provide all the city management solutions based on this robust uh, digital platform. So on the digital government services areas, we also launched a new initiative we called Government Online Offline Shanghai, which is a unified portal to provide the government services to citizens, to businesses, that only needs you to go there once and you can get everything done. At the back, this is also a, a very good example of how we consolidate the data and then we can provide a unified service to improve the efficiency. 
in the economy areas, there are so many uh, different kinds of uh, uh, use cases. And so one of this very uh, unique application, what we call is a uh, inclusive finance based on the government open data. So we consolidate, uh, there are about 484 some data sets from nine different kinds of government agencies, plus some uh, industrial data. Then we open it up and provide to the banks so banks can leverage on those kind of data to judge whether we can lend money to uh, certain SMEs, how much we can lend, and after the lending, how can we effectively to collect back those monies. So this is a really a good examples for uh, data to provide the values in the bank services. So in the livelihood, there are so many other uh, application and use cases. One of the examples is how we leverage the data to provide the better services in the hospital scenarios. So like you see in this picture, there's always so many lines to be queued in the hospital before you can go to see a doctor, before you can collect the subscribed medicines. But now because of the consolidated data, then we can provide the services to reduce the time, the payment in the, in the, in the medicine collections. So those are really so many good examples how we uh, use the combined or consolidated data to create some values. So every single scenario at the back, there are data to provide the value. So how can we uh, provide a, a very uh, effective data market to support those kind of applications is really based on our Shanghai Data Exchange. So in this year in China, we are not only limited to, to the data exchange in the business areas, uh, data sharing in the government areas, we are trying to create a new market, what we call data factor market, which will uh, leverage, which will uh, provide more uh, data uh, to be shared, uh, treated among the business and the government. So in this kind of, of area, we need to have some breakthroughs uh, use the innovation. Innovation, we need to understand the data rights and uh, what kind of data to be treated and how can we leverage on the uh, legal system to support this. And finally, how can we treat the data not only as a product, a service, but also as a asset. So in those areas, we need some breakthroughs. Now we have spent lots of time and efforts uh, to create this kind of new uh, applications. In the last couple of years, uh, Shanghai Data Exchange already uh, set up this kind of data market, which we done, what we call is, we try to create a network to connect the data resources and the data usage together. So that's why it becomes very effective. What we done, uh, not only to connect those resources, but also we try to build a platform to define the rule, the technology, the applications. So this is some innovation we've done in Shanghai in China to, to empower the smart city applications. So in the future, you will see there are, are so many other uh, new creative applications based on this kind of data factor market. Today, I might not have much time to uh, explore the details, but I look, do look forward to seeing a person soon so that we can discuss and uh, communicate more in this areas. Thanks. Thank you for watching. Bye. Yeah. Uh, 잘 들었습니다. So thank you for the presentation. So we can see that various efforts are ongoing and we have been seeing great progress made, but nevertheless, I think that there's always the issue of privacy. And I'm sure that Professor Yu and Zhang, you have thought hard about the privacy issue, right? Do you have any opinions on this issue, privacy? Yes, because when you collect data, uh, there is always a privacy issue associated with that. So can you uh, touch upon that? Yes. 
Well, the Shanghai Data Exchange was launched in 2016, and before this was launched, we actually came up with a guideline. We prepared it for three years, and after the three-year preparation, we launched the exchange, and we called it the Data Exchange. What we did was we do not just simply collect, accumulate the data, but we ensure that A and B can exchange the data. So. As it was mentioned before, the data has to be integrated, and so there has to be also the privacy issue. You have to protect the private information, and also a lot of different data are being integrated together, and we had to make preparations for that. And all of those aspects are included in the guideline. In Korea, for example, there is de-identified data. For example, there are five people in a photo. We only expose the face of one person that we need to expose. And the meta information or the metadata in that photo is not exposed. So within that service, well, when we were developing the service in the platform, we designed all that. And also, when there is an exchange of data between A and B, uh, there can't be a leak of data or a leak of information. And companies are very sensitive about that. So we wanted to prevent that. And and so we made up a gateway, and we could ensure that a module is used to exchange data in a safe manner. So we have prepared for that for three years, and then we launched the Shanghai Exchange for in 2016. So it was based on a lot of expertise and know-how. Data exchange, this is a very fairly new concept. And I think that this is a future agenda for us. We have to, what well, we call this data capitalism. In some point in the future, we will come to that era. And I think that this is the beginning stage of all that. Yeah. Uh, in the case of uh, the case that we've just, just seen now in, in Shanghai Data Exchange, it's a government-led project with uh, companies working as partners. But for us, what happens is we seek consent from the citizens to use their data, and we offer services based on the data. So there is a pilot program that we're doing right now. And can I just uh, share with you that information on how this is done, on how we use citizen data based on their consent? This is the Smart Receipt Project. Typically, if we think of a Smart Receipt Project, uh, what happens is we always get a receipt when we buy something, when there's a transaction. And in the past, we had receipts more than, I think, dollars uh, or one in our, in our wallets. So many receipts. And the data on those receipts, uh, we thought that there may be uh, some way to utilize this, uh, to have this transported to the smartphone application. I mentioned that in order to have citizens use the data, we need four steps along the way. What we would do here is to first convert the receipts, the information on the receipts into data. If you look at the receipts, as you can see here on the screen, it indicates the address of the store and a lot of uh, many pieces of information. But there's also location information. And you can see that li uh, um, location data is not just something that you can see on maps. You can see on these receipts the addresses of the stores. So this is also location-based data. So first we planned out how we're going to use this data and what we're going to use this data for. And after we did that, we started to collect the receipts. Through these transaction terminals, whichever payment terminal it may be, if there were, was a transaction, uh, a rec uh, receipt will be issued, and all of this information was gathered. And once we do collect uh, this information, we call this uh, data. It's converted into data, and we are using this data uh, for services. So it's about uh, de-identification, masking, uh, reprocessing, uh, to only have the data that we need. So we process this data, and we converted this into information so that it can be shared with others. And once we have that channel in place, what would we what we would do afterwards is to make this into a service. It could be through various applications, starting from the receipts, coupons, offer the services to the customers. And based on this receipt data and information, there could be some future services possible. Because, of course, we need to converge data, but we can make this into intelligent services where, for instance, I have three kids, and my youngest is uh, currently in first grade. 
Well, yes, it's very challenging, by the way. Uh, I see. I see you're having a rough time. Yes, yes, you have three. Well, are they all boys? All boys? Uh, I think, well, they're like boys, but I do have a daughter. Uh, sorry, I was uh, t taken off guard. All of a sudden, I'm thinking of my kids. And So boys or girls? You don't remember? Oh, no. You're really um, confused. Uh-oh. I think I had a daughter, I think. So, yes. Anyways, uh, my youngest, uh, well, actually, I have twins. I am the youngest. They're twins. Uh, they're in first grade. And in five years or six years, they're going to go to middle school. And uh, all of the receipt information. If you look at my transactions, I have, as a parent of a first grader, uh, we would buy various books or workbooks for our, um, a first grader. But then if they become middle school students, if we use the same data, we will be offering some new services. In other words, we can, provide, we can be provided with personalized services based on the age of my child. And because we will be gathering those receipt information. And as mentioned by uh, Shanghai Data Exchange, we can also extend uh, personalized loans to SMEs depending on their situations. So this research receipt information is actually being used uh, with Chunju, and this is a brief article that I wanted to share with you. So yes, so this is a very short clip on what's happening at Chunju. In Chunju, we have 12 uh, city uh, libraries, and when you uh, borrow a book, uh, you can actually accumulate points. Uh, it's uh, the Chunju. Uh, love book points. So once you apply for the service and every time you return a book, you get 50 points and uh, the points will accumulate. And these points can be used in bookstores in the region like cash. Uh, these uh, regional uh, bookstores, uh, compared to online and large-scale stores, they do not have a price advantage and they're um, isolated in many cases. So I hope that by using this policy, citizens will uh, utilize and buy more books in, at these local stores. As mentioned, a smart city is about enhancing the quality of life of citizens and solving urban problems. And as you've seen in this news clip, these local bookstores uh, need uh, some more push and drive. This was a critical challenge of Chunju City. So what happens if, if you borrow the books from the library to get points, and when you do want to buy books from the bookstore, uh, you can actually use these points. Uh, you can utilize these points using this platform. And in the bookstores, they also sell coffee, for instance. So what happens here is the data, uh, we wanted information on uh, just purely on buying books. So uh, through our smart receipt service, we would gather the information from the receipts to see uh, whether they bought books or whether they bought coffee and how many points should be accumulated depending on which uh, purchase or what, what they purchased. So this was a project that was done. Yes, thank you. There, I have a question for Kristen Kim, and we will listen to the answer, and then I'll go back to the two people. Now, what three words? I understand that you are conducting a project here in Korea as well, and I want to ask you, are there any points that you think needs improvement that you felt as you carried out the pro your Korean project? What needs improvement in Korea? Uh, do you mean improvements in uh, location data in Korea in general, or our project? Uh, so, yes, anything as you were carrying out your project in Korea, any hurdles that you met along the way, any challenges that you faced uh, while doing business in Korea? Um, so, I think one particular thing that I found interesting about Korea, not necessarily a challenge per se, but I think we definitely have to be smoother about it, is um, there's a sense that it's hard for a foreign company to do business in Korea, even when you send someone, because a lot of Korean systems are very localized, and it's, it's kind of difficult for someone who's a foreigner to come in and be able to integrate into that. So I'll give a very specific example. I tried to use Kakao Talk, uh, sorry, Kakao Tea, no, no. to get a taxi to come here. But what's it, the injungso, like the identity verification? Oh, injungso, no. It wouldn't let me do that because I don't have a permanent Korean phone number here. 
And so more broadly, it's not specific to what three words uh, in business yeah, in, yeah. in Korea, but I think doing business in Korea in general, sometimes the ways in which we've architected data systems can make it difficult to, to actually uh, navigate through it. I don't know if I answered your question, but that was top of mind for me. Mm. 그러니까 you... So, this is the personal certification or verification system that we have. And it's actually put in place to protect the individuals, but actually that sometimes might be an obstacle for doing business here in Korea, providing services and using the services in Korea. And I'm sure that you might agree, Mr. Lee and also Director Im, I'm sure you had similar experiences. But because this is privacy and personal information, there are some need to protect uh, the individuals, but at the same time, I think that there is a need to expand the business services. So there are some clashes or conflict of interest, but at the same time, uh, perhaps there can be some benefits of that. So give us your thoughts. What do you think are the limitations, the challenges that we have to overcome, and what do you think are the benefits of these types of approaches? Yes, let me go first. Well, Professor Yu Jung, she talked about and emphasized how important data is in smart cities. But I think that data can be like ingredients for making food. The data has to be fresh. There has to be abundant data, abundant ingredients in order to help make the good decisions. But I think that when it comes to the quality and the quantity of raw data, there are some uh, improvements required from a business perspective, for example, we utilize data related to land and real estate, and sometimes there are some information that is not revealed. For example, in the case of apartment complexes or apartment buildings, only uh, the floor level, like whether it's the third floor or the fourth floor, that kind of information only revealed, and more accurate information about what apartment unit has been sold is not provided. So I think that there's a lot of information that has not been uh, transferred formed into data for utilization. And for example, there might be some regulations that only apply to certain districts. And these are actually very important for real estate information, but these types of regulations may not be digitalized. They are just provided in the PDF format and it makes it really difficult for us to utilize. So I think that there has to be an improvement in the data quality and also there has to be, the, there are some errors that we can find in the data provided by the public sector and we have to take care of that as well. And that will help businesses better utilize data. Okay, so any thoughts on this, Professor Yu, if you can summarize? Yes. Well, I think that that was a very good example and case that um, Director Im mentioned. And Christine, she talked about the certification uh, issue. Well, in Korea, I understand that we have a lot of data, but there's abundant data, but actually, the problem is, is that there is not enough in-depth data in Korea. So, for example, it was mentioned by Ms. Lim, but we cannot know exactly what lot of land has been or parcel of land has been uh, traded. So we need that detailed in-depth data. Uh, but actually, it's a bit obscure sometimes. So we, that has to be improved. And also for the startups, in order for the startups to provide very uh, detailed or targeted services, I think that these types of data, so in-depth data, are more important compared to the large corporations in some sense. So sometimes uh, you have to receive the government approval to engage or provide some types of services. The government might say, you can provide this type of service, but that the other type cannot be approved here in Korea. Now, we talked about mobility, and you know that there was this issue between the mobility service providers against the existing uh, taxi companies. So this actually is something that cannot be uh, resolved. These types of clashes cannot be resolved overnight. But we have to take the time to actually uh, resolve these conflicts of interest. So, Kristen Kim? So, what? Do you think, uh, what kind of things do you think should improve in Korea uh, to conduct uh, your programs and businesses in a better fashion in Korea? What should we change in Korea? Um, I think, I think the issue, uh, just kind of, kind of connecting all the threads together that everybody's kind of touched upon, the issue of data privacy and the tension of privacy, personal privacy, data sovereignty, and efficiencies 
I think it all comes together here, right? Because as people from different countries are meeting in person more and more, as we're learning to live with COVID, um, you are entering environments, in this case, smart cities, you're inventing environments where your data is gonna be taken by different organizations for different purposes, whether you want them to or not in some cases. In other cases, if the smart cities do it well, they will give you information on what they want consent to use your data for. As Director Lee, you mentioned, you ask for consent, explicit informed consent, so I know what I'm giving my data for. This, this affects the ways in which we interact with each other for business meetings and whatnot. I, for example, when I came in here, I had to give so much data to the Korean government in order to um, uh, be compliant with the COVID uh, lockdown regulation, self-diagnosing every day, twice. They have so much information on me. Did I get, did I give my consent? Not really, because if I don't, I can't do business here, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's more an understanding of, we have to come to an understanding internationally of what are we comfortable with in terms of privacy, when I, what I'm allowing you to take from me and what you will take from me because you, you, you have the, the, the power and the authority to take from me. And so I think those are kind of like the meta-level questions that I think everybody is asking here. Um, and it does affect business uh, to a deep extent. Yes, thank you very much. Now, when it comes to the privacy issue, uh, there are some service platforms that require the consent of the data owner. And sometimes you might feel that you consent, not because you generally want to consent, but you have to and you have no choice. So I think that that's some, in some sense in line with what Ms. Kim said. But I think that in order, well, as long as you're not too uncomfortable with that, uh, sometimes you give consent. But anyhow, there are relevant issues that have to be improved going into the future. So it's time to wrap up. And I think that we have been focusing on the topic of how data can change smart cities. And I would like to ask each speaker to uh, give your impression of the dialogue that we had today and use five characters to um, express how data can change smart cities. Okay, Mr. Lee, go first. Good. Yes, because I am at the center. Let me start, for, uh, start first. Okay, data will change uh, uh, the paradigm of smart city. But can you put that in maybe five characters in Korean? I'm sorry, I, I think maybe this is too long. Yes, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, my dream when I was young. Uh, yes, uh, well, would that work? Because when we were young, there are things that we imagined, and we're now seeing that become a reality right now. Uh, when we were listening to the various presentations, uh, I remember that it was 1965, uh, and there was this cartoon of what Korea was like in the past. And it, they said that uh, we'll be seeing EVs, and we'll be seeing, well, studying online at home. Uh, and this wasn't the imagination back then, but now it's all a reality. So there were th certain things that I dreamed of, of seeing the robot uh, all of a sudden soaring from ha the Han River. Of course, we don't see flying cars right now, not yet. Uh, but uh, with data, there would be a smart city that would be possible. And uh, one day, I think uh, imag our imagination will come true. So anything that we dreamed of. Uh, the things that we draw, drew uh, in our sketchbooks uh, and someday will become a reality. So I want to say the dream that I dreamed when I was young. Yes, thank you very much for that. And Director Lee Mei-yeun? Uh, please, uh, five Korean characters. Oh, this is so difficult. More the, Beyond your imagination, that's five characters in Korean. Think about when we first experienced the smartphone. In the past, we only used phones to make calls or send SMS, short messages. But now we're watching films using your hand phones. Your, and we're enjoying so many different services. So I think that that's the same for the smart cities. We will be able to enjoy services beyond our imagination. And this will be based on data. So I would like to say, sang sang ku sang beyond your imagination. So, Christine Kim, would it be possible five characters in Korean, or it doesn't have to be five? <laughs> Smart cities to empower city dwellers. So, smart city for city dwellers. 
Yes, so how many characters would that be in Korean if we translate that? Yes, so a smart city for some city dwellers. Great. I think that it is the overarching goal that we want to achieve. Thank you. Yes, Professor Yu Eun-jung, uh, why don't you summarize our session before we close? What do you think? Well, I think that she just touched upon what I wanted to say. So I would like to say what, does, what this means is that let me elaborate. Now, we watched the presentation of AWS, and in that presentation, we could see that every, it, there has to be empowerment of the citizens and the citizens have lead the way. We talk about data, but citizens are the users and uh, they are the holders, the owners of the data. Now, citizens have to take the lead in operating the city. Why? Because that will make cities more transparent. I should be involved and I should give the ideas to run the cities. Citizens have to be the owners of the cities. So everything has to be citizens driven and we need to lay the foundation for that. That is the direction that the world is heading into. And so today, we were able to invite many experts from different fields, and we were able to hear many different case studies. There were very specific examples that we were able to hear. It was very uh, insightful to hear these experiences. And I think that in that sense, this was a very meaningful opportunity for all of us. Yes, thank you very much. We were able to uh, obtain a lot of food for thought. This is the last day of the 2021 World Smart City Expo. We are here at the tech conference, and I'm sure that our participants would have probably gained uh, insight as well. So data can be utilized for innovation, for improving the environment, and also to create sustainable cities. But for that, I think that everyone has to work together. And I do hope that we have more opportunities to engage in di dialogue in the future. And I hope that I am invited more often as well. So with this, I would like to thank all of the participants uh, once again. And especially, I would like to thank the four people on stage. And with that, I would like to close the Smart Tech Conference. I am Zhu Zheng, and thank you very much.